technology defines the cloud this way. Basically what it is, is taking all of your IT resources and instead of buying IT as we traditionally do, you go, talk, go to a cloud provider and you buy uh, IT as a service from them. And so what this really matters is I've been in IT for 25 years and in the last five to 10 years, really around 2000, People in the 90s, they just bought computers, you know, Y2K, scare the boss, go buy computers, right? So after 2000, they had to actually justify projects. So the last 10 years, I've been doing IT planning for companies. And so a couple years ago, the cloud kind of got underneath my, my, my thoughts a little bit. And so I started doing research. 90, 95% of anything written on the cloud says, never going to happen, it's not safe, it's not secure, it's bad, 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 bad. And 5% says, this is going to happen, can't stop it, it's the greatest thing ever. The more research I did, I found that the 95% were people who had a dependence on the IT industry. They might have been journalists, but they were IT publication journalists. They were people who build infrastructures, or people that sell computers, uh, people that sell licensing. The 5% were mostly people that were not in IT. Business owners, board of directors, uh, controllers, and then a couple little CEOs like Steve Ballmer that runs this little software company called Microsoft. Uh, Sam Palmisano runs a little hardware company called IBM. Uh, the CEO of HP, uh, CEO of Oracle, CEO of all the major hardware and software providers were saying the cloud is gonna happen, we can't stop it, we're getting on the train. So I started thinking, these guys probably predict the future in IT a little better than I do. So. I really researched this and found I think that is absolutely true. I think in a few years you will no longer know what kind of software you're buying. You won't know if you're running Oracle, you won't know if you're running Sybase, you won't know if you're running PeopleSoft or GradeSpeed or what any kind, you won't care. What you'll buy is you'll buy software as a service. And so that's what we're doing today. It's, it's, we're doing it, but we're doing it inside of company. So today, you sit at your computer, you sit at your desktop or your laptop, and you go in and you do your daily business, whatever that is, operations, uh, emailing, uh, order entry, accounting, whatever you're going to do, you sit at your desk, it goes into this magic thing called the network, all these servers, everything in the back end talks to each other, and then you get your screen back and you keep going. We live that way, we buy that way, we function that way. And so today, that stuff inside the cloud, in that picture up there, exists inside the IT department in most of our businesses. In the future, that's not going to be the case. So why is that happening? Why are people moving in this direction? Well, there's a couple things driving it. The first thing is, is that the economy has people looking at things they never looked at before. So they're saying, I'm not going to spend money unless I really need to spend money, and I'm going to reduce costs no matter what. So they're looking at IT to say, should I really continue doing what I'm doing or should I do something different? The second thing they're doing is, just like we saw here today, we've got great IT people. They really know their business. They really know what they're doing, but stuff goes down, right? And it affects my business when it goes down, right? So there was a hospital that I was working with. It had an eight hour outage between 11 and seven, 11 in the morning and 7 p.m. A lot of people were in there being treated between 11 in the morning and 7 p.m. Big problem for them. When your IT department makes a mistake, what do you do? You yell at them, you say do better. You're doing a great job here, it's just things happen. When you're working with a cloud vendor, if they're big vendors like IBM and Microsoft and some of the other people that are in this market, you have a stick. You've got a contract with them that says, if you're down over a certain amount of time, you give me money back. So there is now an accountability around this. And the other piece is, is that people in business carry a phone. And on their phone, they're talking on Facebook, they're checking their emails, they're doing all these things. They want to run their business that way. When they go to IT in the past, IT says, oh, that's way harder than you think it is. That's always been the response. It's way more difficult than you think. And, it's, and then when they did the project, it took longer and cost more than they said it was going to in the first place. And so now they're saying, we have to be able to do things in a better way. So they're doing that because 
They want to have the financial benefits. They want to reduce cost, but increase service. They also want to have better control. Now that seems crazy, right? That's crazy talk. I'm going to take everything I have from inside my data center where I control it, and I'm going to give it to somebody like Microsoft to run in a shared environment. How is that better control? Well, part of it is like I talked about before. You have service level agreements. If it goes down, they have to pay you. If they lose your data, I, 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 if somebody breaks in and steals credit card data from, from you, if it's housed with them, they pay you. They recover some of that loss. Uh, they also are huge. These companies that do this are huge. So they have so the ability to uh, protect you in ways that you can't do that internally. And then the last thing is, is that the technology is here. It's going to talk in a second. It needs to get a little bit better, but it's pretty much there. So how do we reduce costs? Well, these people like Microsoft, they buy computers in what they call containers. I read an article on it not too long ago. I talked to Microsoft uh, data center people about six months ago. They get a container, and it comes in. It's 2,000. It's, a, it's on a semi-truck, and they open the truck, and the whole container comes out. It's got 2,000 computers with like four to eight CPUs in each one, all wired, all connected, all running Windows, all ready to go. It's all got virtualization on it. They just plug them in and go. When you get into those kind of volumes, your cost for air conditioning goes down, your cost for floor space goes down, your cost for support goes down. You just can't, and the cost of hardware, I mean, forget it. Forget about it. If you can't buy 100 servers or 200 servers for what these guys buy, 200,000 servers for so they have much lower overhead to provide these services. And they have the volumes to get software licensing. They have the volumes to get support. If you, if you were going to be uh, an IT guy, would you rather go support uh, 100,000 servers in Seattle? Or would you rather ser support 10 servers in Houston? Right? Even if you love Houston. So. But with this technology today, everybody, everybody who doesn't have the internet in their house, right, you're in. So all of us have access all the time to the internet. We have access to um, our applications. We have access to instant messaging and email, even when we're at the store. I'm not, I'm not just talking about at the house. You know, we're, we are getting to the place where you have access to everything you need everywhere that you are. Another piece of this is there's been a big trend in IT in the last few years is called virtualization. All it means is, is you create a software computer that, look, that acts like a real computer and you run a bunch of them on top of a real computer. The key to that is, is you can take one of those virtual machines and move it anywhere you want pretty easily. So what it can do now is, is that you can take a whole data center for, full of virtual servers and you can just ship them off to an, a cloud provider and you can't tell the difference. Even in the transition, you can't tell what's local and what's not. And so, what is this doing now to our economy? Well, I'll tell you what it does to the economy. You take the data centers and you put them in, today we have large data centers in Seattle, in Dallas, in Atlanta, um, Chicago, New York. And so these major data centers uh, exist today, and they will be able to absorb most of the IT departments from our companies, because it's financially it's going to be beneficial. When you have these huge companies with lots of people that are experienced, they also have best practices inherently built in. They know how to replicate the data, how to back it up, how to make sure that it's up all the time so they can meet their service level agreements. Well, part of that is... You want to have a copy in America, but you also want a copy in Europe. You want it to follow the sun, right? So that if there's a big issue in America, like when we had the whole East Coast lose power, you don't want that to cause your whole cloud to go down. So they'll put data centers in China, in India, in Europe, in Africa, in these places where the cost of uh, labor is so much cheaper, the cost of, of real estate is so much cheaper. What that, what's that going to do? That means you're going to build out where you already have. And then in the U.S. and in North America, and then you're going to do all your new construction overseas. Now, what kind of people are we going to have then in the data centers here? We're going to have support people because we're pretty much build everything, help you move it in, and help you keep it running while it's here. Overseas, they're going to have the pe they're going to have more people with new jobs. They're going to do all that kind of work, build things out, support them, keep them running. What are the people inside the U.S. going to have for jobs? 
Well, the IT job is no longer going to be come in and build a server and, and make it available to people. It's not going to be a deep technology type of function. It's going to be translate what I do from a business into uh, a requirements document or information that I can give to this cloud provider so that they can uh, meet the needs that I have them because the cloud providers, Microsoft and IBM, they really know computers, but they don't know your business. And so traditionally, business analyst functions like I'm describing have been the low end of the uh, income level for IT professionals. It's usually where people start. They start there and then move into new jobs. What we're going to see is that's going to become the staple uh, for IT business in the U.S. Now, this, this second part of that is in where we have the major hubs, you'll have a lot of IT infrastructure professionals, but they're not going to be uh, nearly as many as you have today because they'll just be in those major areas. The last thing is, is that we're going to see even help desk support shifting to those other countries. So if I could have, if I have 10,000 clients and they're calling me when they need help and I, and I can have, I'm going to want people 24 hours a day. So I'm going to set up call centers overseas as well as in North America. But it's often cheaper to put those in Panama or Argentina than to put them in the U.S. And it's still in the same time zone. So you could have one in India, one in the U.S., and one in Africa, and you could cover uh, 24 hours a day. So the big shift is going to be away from deep technology into uh, an understanding of how business relies on IT. And there's going to be a new role that's going to be created inside of companies that I, that I think it, it's going to be an executive level position. It might still be a CIO, a chief information officer, but it, it's going to be somebody who's responsible for writing these contracts. Because that's what you're doing, is you're mitigating the business risk of taking my IT department and giving it to somebody else to run. And so how you write that contract how you hold them accountable, what you require them to do, and how you're willing, able to monitor them is going to be critical. So if, they, if, you go, if you're down for eight hours and you call them and say, we were down for eight hours, and they say, no, you weren't, you're going to have to have been monitoring them and show, yes, we were, and here's our proof, and here's what it pays us the money. So writing those contracts, how they're being handled, writing your requirements in details, because as an IT provider, why does IT have a black eye today? It's because you go to them and you say, I want something that looks like this. That's not really what you want. You want something that looks like this. And then they build you this and say, this is what you told us you needed. Right? So we're going to have new people in our field that can define this in a way that the cloud provider won't have an out when they build that. Second piece is, is that they will be able to learn the business and what their business does as well as what the IT needs are. So people aren't going to be writing IT documents um, for doctors that don't have a background in medicine. And so we're going to have to make a major shift in how we're preparing our kids going forward. And there's two sides of that coin. The first one is, by the time kids are two years old, they have spent more time on the computer than my 85-year-old mother has, right? And it's a part of who they are. So there's coming a time when they're going to be able, they're going to expect and demand that they be able to get at whatever they need wherever it is. It'll be a, there'll be a time when kids will be standing in line to go see a movie and mom will say, did you do your homework? And they'll say no. And she'll say, well, you got to get to the counter to finish it, right? or we're going home because that's what they're going to demand that we do and that people are going to expect to demand that they be able to work from their house they work from their car a friend of mine at Boeing is designing laptops in the back of seats so that you can work while you're flying on the plane and have access to the internet it's going to be a part of everywhere we go and everything we do these kids need to be ready for that the second piece of this is is that that these kids are going to need to have the skills they need to provide the I, meet the IT job market that's going to exist in 10, 15, or 20 years, not what exists today. So knowing great details on deep technical skills and what a megahertz and a gigahertz is doesn't won't make a big difference. What will make a difference for them is 
if I'm a doctor and I'm taking an order, how can I make sure that this complies with all the HIPAA requirements and allows me to get all the maximum funding from the AAR documentation that Obama's people wrote, as well as meets the needs and gets me paid by the major insurance companies. And they have to speak all that language that the insurance companies speak, as well as what the doctors speak, as well as the IT requirements of what people do. Those, this business analyst job can become a much higher paying job if we train people well and we set the expectations of business correctly. So we need to change what we're teaching them and we need to change what we're providing them. And so basically the, the bottom line is, is that what we have today is all the high pay IT jobs are gonna be going that we think of today as IT jobs. Probably 80 to 90 percent of them are gonna go overseas. We're not gonna keep IT in house anymore. We're gonna move it into the cloud. We're gonna buy IT services by the drink. People are gonna get on their Blackberry, people are gonna get on their iPhone, and they're going to uh, pull up transactions and run things. They're gonna, just like you do today. Instead of picking which uh, subway you want in New York City off your iPhone, you're gonna say, do I wanna sell this product to this particular customer of mine, and how do I take that order, and how do I ship it all on your phone? That's the way things are gonna, and all it needs is the interface of the phone to get a little bit better. It's not where it, is, it needs to be today, but within two to five years, it's going to be where people won't want a desktop or a laptop anymore. So when that happens, IT jobs is, that we know today are going to shift overseas. The 10 to 20 percent that are left are the traditional low-paying jobs, and we're going to have to transition them into higher-paying jobs, and we're going to have to build new skills into our people. They're going to need to be able to speak accounting as well as computers, or operations as well as computers. And we're going to need to teach them how to design things. Because whenever, whatever they hand to these companies, they're going to need to design it, lay it out, plan it, and tell us how it's going to work and interact, and interact with all the other vendors that they're working with. So the higher end skills is what's going to be retained in this country, and, it, and we need to prepare our, our children to do that. You can get them excited about technology, but they need to be excited in a way that will be marketable in the future.